Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, the perils of delivering pizza, no joke. The man hoping for a Democratic primary upset in his race against longtime Brooklyn Congresswoman Yvette Clark. And Weeksville's second Saturday this week with Brick. Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Ross Tuttle, filling in for Ashley Ford, who's making her second trip in three weeks to, ready for it? Disneyland. I hope you're having fun out there, Ashley. Meantime, this is a really crazy story, for starters. It began with a call for some pizza and ended up with a trip to immigration detention. This happened a few days ago, and the details of this story, I think, are still coming out, but a pizza delivery person named Pablo Villavicencia went to deliver pizza at Brooklyn's Fort Hamilton military base. When a soldier there asked him for a valid ID, and I guess maybe he was unable to produce something satisfying to the guard, the guard, instead of calling the guys who ordered the pizza to come down and get their pizza, called immigration officials to come and arrest him. And that's what the immigration officials, ICE, did. According to El Diario, where the story was first reported, Villa Vincencia is undocumented, but his wife and two children are U.S. citizens. And from what we know so far, here's a guy going about his life, trying to make a living, support his family in what's supposedly a sanctuary city, and then this happens? To help us maybe learn a little bit more about this or what kind of investigation might ensue, we're joined on the phone by City Council member Carlos Menchaca, uh, who is also the chair of the Committee on Immigration. Uh, Council member, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? And thanks for having me on the show today. Well, we appreciate you uh, coming on at such short notice. You know, this is one of those stories that you, you read and you're like, this cannot be true. How, how does something like this happen? And what do, you, what do you know about this story? What are the latest details? Well, I think that's the number one question. How, how did this happen? Uh, and there are a lot of questions about the interaction, what happened between Pablo uh, and the, the military personnel um, at the time of the incident. And not only that, but how quickly someone was kind of stopped, questioned, and delivered literally to ICE. Uh, and I think what what we we have to remember is that this is happening to the family, uh, to to a family that was just going about their day, uh, making a living in the city. Uh, this family is from Long Island. Um, I will say that. Mm -hmm. um, been speaking, uh, me and my team have been speaking to the wife directly, mm. and our real first priority is ensuring that the family is okay and that they have what they need right now to fight, um, fight mm. for uh, Pablo, a father and a husband. Uh, and the other piece to this is that Sandra, the wife, uh, has has uh, been incredibly overwhelmed with both support and reporters and people wanting to come and ask questions. And this has turned the entire family upside down. Uh, they are scared of what's, what's to come. Right. I mean, that's something we should, we should point out, certainly, that this is a, a husband. He has two children. And this kind of separation, I mean, we all know what kind of trauma this can lead to, what kind of um, victimization that they might feel, that they might feel now they're targeted, uh, and how this can really introduce such a level of uncertainty, not to mention the financial hardship that they may endure because of this. Exactly. And Pablo was uh, the breadwinner for the family. Uh, this is a family that has no other family support in the city. Uh, so they are, they are alone in so many different ways uh, here in the city. And so we're just trying to make sure that, that the family gets stabilized in this time. Uh, Pablo is in custody right now with immigration and an immigration detention center um, waiting for, for bond. Uh, we're trying to find a lawyer to ensure that a good, trusted lawyer can, can come and support this family. Uh, and that's one of the things that this city council has been struggling right now with and ensuring that every immigrant gets access to legal services. Right. That's, that's the promise of due process. Uh, here in the city. This feels like, you know, like something you would hear about in Arizona, you know, the kind of show us your papers mentality where it escalated so quickly. You know, you look a certain way, I want to make sure that you're a citizen. And if not, I'm going to go call ICE, kind of like what we saw in Manhattan, you know, a couple weeks back with the lawyer who was screaming at the people that he was going to call ICE because they were speaking Spanish. I mean, what is going on? Exactly. And, and look, we, we have been doing so much work right now to really curb any any uh, incident like this through our NYPD creating policies 
that really remove um, a, a, a kind of uh, approach from the NYPD for any one of our New York City residents. But this did happen on a military base. This was federal, clearly a federal military base. Mm -hmm. But they are in New York City, and there's a lot of questions that we need to be asking about what's happening over there and how we can work together uh, to really ensure these little blind spots that we have right now that are, are, are making all our families unsafe. And all of us are feeling this right now as we watch this story unfold mm -hmm. and bring more resources to the family and to, this, and, and to the investigation. Is that the kind of thing that your, um, your committee can help spearhead, the kind of investigation into this to see how things like this happen and maybe how they can be avoided in the future? No doubt. And we're going to be working with the local council member. The actual representative for this space is Justin Brennan, um, uh, who is a progressive caucus member and a, and a partner of mine. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the work we'll do through the committee is really providing that kind of oversight to understand and bring to light what's happening and what could change. And I'm not going to put anything off the table. Everything is, I think, possible if we have a discussion with this base and what they're here for, what they're not here for, how they got access to information that would have prompted an ICE uh, call, like what they did. Um, and then another question is, uh, if he was driving a vehicle, if he didn't provide a, a, a driver's license, we have a governor that has yet to do anything about granting an opportunity for everyone, no matter their immigration status, a driver's license in this state that was just taken away after 9-11 mm -hmm. and could be granted back. These are the things and protections that New Yorkers and the leaders that are leading New York can do right now to protect our families, and they're just simply not. So yeah. we've got a lot of work to do here. Well, well Council Member, thank you again for joining us today. I'm sorry we're going to have to cut the conversation off here. We're, we're well, out of time, so but much. really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Coming up, the challenger for New York's ninth congressional seat. Don't go away. In 2016, the Democratic candidate for New York's 9th Congressional District won 92 percent of the vote. That means whoever wins this month's Democratic primary on June 26th will likely be that district's representative, representing much of central Brooklyn. The person who won in 2016 was Yvette Clark, winning re-election to her sixth term in Congress. Standing in the way of her seventh term is our next guest, Adam Bunkadeco, a 30-year-old community organizer and Harvard Business School grad. Mr. Bunkadeco, welcome to 112BK. Thanks. Thanks for welcoming me. Uh, so, um, real quick, whenever we talk about you know federal sure. politics, federal government, there's an elephant in the room these days, right? <laughs> an orange one. <laughs> A large one. I'm not going to ask any questions about that elephant, but you're welcome to bring it up if, sure. you, if you so choose, but sure. I just want to put that aside right now. So, But first, just a simple question. Why, why are you running? Yeah, so uh, thanks for again for having me. Um, the true reason why I've chosen to do this is because I think over the last decade, we haven't had the kind of representation uh, we need or we've deserved. And as someone who's the son of two war refugees from Uganda, uh, my parents worked day and night to, to ensure that the six children that they had, the six of them that they raised in a one-bedroom apartment, have the kind of opportunities uh, that we were fortunate to have. I was blessed to earn scholarships to go to private school, to attend Haverford College, and eventually Harvard Business School. Um, but there are a number of families uh, in our community, in Crown Heights, in Flatbush, in East Flatbush, in Brownsville, and the like, that are concerned about not only keeping a roof over their head, putting food on the table, uh, but making sure their kids have that same kind of opportunity. And while I salute Ms. Clark for choosing public life, because as someone who's been campaigning for months on end, it's a difficult uh, road. Uh, but uh, those who do choose it, you have to be held accountable. And Ms. Clark hasn't passed a single piece of legislation during her tenure. And we've got a lot of headway to make if we're going to make a difference on the issues that I just highlighted. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to need someone who's going to do the job and work uh, just as hard as families do uh, in this community. When you say she hasn't passed a single piece of legislation, mm -hmm. you mean a piece of legislation that she's been a sponsor of has, yeah. not, has not made it Has through. not introduced mm -hmm. and had that passed both houses and had mm -hmm. reached the president's desk. Uh -huh. yeah. what, would you, what would you like to introduce? Yeah, if so elected? if elected, the first thing I want to focus on is housing. Uh, it is, we're in the middle of a housing crisis here in central Brooklyn. Um, rent is up over 20% or more in some parts of central Brooklyn, in particular in the parts that I just highlighted, Crown Heights, Flatbush, East Flatbush, Brownsville. So on the federal level, I'd like to introduce a program uh, similar to the Mitchell Lama program we have here in the state that would allow for low and moderate income families not only the opportunity to rent, but to purchase a cooperative. 
I think that's what made the Mitchell Lama program so great and so successful here in the state, is that it gave uh, working class and middle class families a stable anchor uh, through a sea of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, I should just step back talking about passing legislation. I should sure. say it feels like Congress hasn't passed itself a single piece of legislation yeah. in the last 10 years, maybe other than some tax cuts um, yeah. in, in her defense. Yeah. Um, but so what, that brings me to my other question, yeah. which is, so this is your first campaign sure. for any elected office, right? Sure. Yeah, it is. I, 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 I've served in uh, government before. Oh, you have? Yeah. What? So I worked at the state's economic development agency, okay. uh, focused on uh, revitalizing some of the most distressed parts in central Brooklyn. And I, before that, I started off as an organizer, mm -hmm. knocking on doors, collecting petitions and signatures for candidates right. and causes I thought were going to make a difference mm -hmm. in the lives of working people. But and so, but this is your first time running for elected office. Yeah, this is the first time running for and elected so office. And so, one might wonder, you know, why not start small, local, sure. when you could also argue that that might be a place where you could indeed do more for your community? That's a worthwhile question that I had asked myself, but I looked around the scene. I mean, we have a number of folks, at least in my community, who are my uh, I'm a constituent of, mm -hmm. and either they're being primaried currently or they uh, are doing a fantastic job. So I looked at Ms. Clark, who had been, again, in the Congress when both Democrats controlled and both Republicans controlled, and asked myself, what, what is the record uh, that she's shown over those 12 years? And to me, when I look at all the sort of leading indicators, whether it's housing, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's education, we've been falling behind. And we've been sort of making excuses as to why things couldn't ha get done. Uh, there are members with less tenure than her, mm -hmm. uh, members who've only been in, in con Congress with Republican control, yet they've been able to make a difference in their communities and get things done. So why aren't we having that in our own community? Right. And when you talk about criminal justice reform, mm -hmm. say, just to take that as one example, sure. and there has been some progress, albeit, yeah. you know, maybe modest, you sure. know, people talking about bail reform, which hasn't yeah. happened yet. Raise the age did yeah. happen in the state, which yeah. was, I think, important uh, for a lot of people, a lot yeah. of um, juveniles who are being processed through adult, uh, the adult court system. Yeah. Um, but what would you, what would you think could happen on a federal level that would really impact sure. um, the local scene? Absolutely. I think, well, if we're talking about criminal justice, uh, I think on both sides of the aisle in Washington, Folks are starting to recognize we need to do something about it. Just recently, about two weeks ago, prison reform had just passed with bipartisan support uh, in the House. And in fact, uh, uh, a neighboring congressperson was the person who was the leading co-sponsor of that here in central Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So I think on that front, I believe legalization of marijuana is uh, a place where we can find common ground. Republican Cory Gardner, a senator from uh, Colorado, uh, has seen the benefits of the legalization of marijuana and what, think we can move forward mm -hmm. to getting decriminalization. But I also think we can get the expungement of felony records for folks who were caught with possession and selling mm -hmm. off on the books. Mm -hmm. uh, as someone who grew up as a person of color in this city, as a black male, uh, many of the friends that I grew up with at 19 or 20 who didn't have the same opportunities I had were unfortunately arrested for uh, things like marijuana. and now are paying effectively a life sentence for that. So we've got to turn this around, mm -hmm. and that's something that I think we can do mm -hmm. in the next Congress. And so you've got, um, you're, so you're running against a Democratic candidate who's mm -hmm. had a long tenure in Congress. Are you getting much support, or what, what's your relationship now with the Democratic Party? I mean, this yeah. is a, a secure Democratic seat. Sure. Um, are you getting support from yeah. them right now, or are people pretty happy kind of with status quo, does it seem? No, I think the grassroots support is where we've gotten the most enthusiasm, and I think that's from folks who are, again, concerned about whether or not they're going to be able to pay rent next year, mm -hmm. whether or not they're going to find a decent job uh, for their loved one, whether or not they're going to find a decent school for their children. They are concerned, and they have been deeply concerned for years. Uh, so the idea that now, on June 26, they have a choice to move away from the status quo and go in a different direction, mm -hmm. I think is an exciting proposition. Right. Now, the establishment, of course, they're going to back the incumbent, right, whether they think she should be there or not. Uh, but I think, more importantly, 
question is, is on the ground in our community, what do people want? And I think people want change. Hmm. Um, so this is a touchy subject because mm -hmm. one shouldn't be basing their vote, you know, on a single sort of designation, say like sure. gender um, alone. But right now, fewer than 20% of those serving the House of Representatives are women. Sure. I mean, how would you feel if you were to unseat one of those individuals sure. and that the, the Congress would therefore feel even less representative sure. of, of our country's Look, population? Look, uh, I, I was raised by a village of strong black women. Uh, anytime I see a system moving into a uh, position of power, I want to champion them, and I want to fight to see them there. But at the same time, the question we also got to ask ourselves is, if you're going to go there and you're not going to fight for working mothers, for folks of color who are suffering the most, then we really got to ask ourselves whether or not that's the best proposition. My, my mom put it best. I want a woman to go in there and fight for our community, to empower our community. But if you're not doing that, then you need to step aside and uh, make sure that we have someone who's going to go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of the folks in our community, the community that's hurt, the group that's been hurt the most by the inactivity that we've had in our current representation are women of color. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the ones who have to pick up the pieces when uh, housing issues come up to the fore mm -hmm. or when loved ones are deported as a result of ICE or whether or not criminal justice issues. That, to me, is where I think we need to be focusing our energy. And right now, we haven't gotten that mm -hmm. in the 12 years. All right. So let's be real for a second. So as somebody who's sure. an outsider, who's never served in Congress before, sure. you might be looking at the situation there the same as a lot of voters are. Like, that place is messed up. Mm -hmm. Nothing is getting done. It's yeah. so partisan. Yeah. No legislation seems to be getting passed, even when you have, mm -hmm. you know, one party yeah. in control of basically the entire government. Yeah. What do you feel, I mean, what do you see in that whole process that gives you encouragement that you can go in there and kind of jumpstart things, make things happen? Yeah, I think what, it, uh, what makes me optimistic is we have got folks who are fed up and are not only fed up but taking action. Mm -hmm. uh, all across this country we see folks who are running for office who ordinarily wouldn't uh, choose public life. And that's an exciting proposition. So in the next Congress, uh, my hope is when Democrats do take back control, we're going to have an exciting group of folks who are ready to make changes mm -hmm. uh, to the status quo, whether it be on housing, uh, criminal justice, but even guns, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think the regular order of politics hasn't really gotten us very far. And that gets to your question about um, the sort of experience. I think I have the right kind of experience. I've been in this community making a difference for folks who are the most vulnerable among us. And that's the kind of work we need to get done in Washington. There are a lot of folks who've had the legislative experience but yet haven't produced very much. Mm -hmm. So we have to call into question whether or not the political arrangement that we have here is working. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it is. And I think a majority of folks would agree. How important is bipartisanship for you? I think it's important, but you know, I, I want to. I'm not going to compromise with people who want to blow up uh, the entire uh, arrangement or demolish the social contract in this country. Uh, I'm willing to work across the aisle with folks who agree that we need to make a difference on key issues. But if you're telling me that you're not for public housing, that you're not for making sure that low-income individuals have a shot at putting food on the table every single day with the SNAP program. If you're telling me that we're going to kick out 10 million immigrants in this country and as the son of war refugees, that's something I can't buy into, nothing I will ever sign on to. That was what made me so uh, a little bit upset about the fact that Ms. Clark had chosen to team up with Daryl Issa. Daryl Issa is someone who, A, conducted, who called Mr. Obama the most corrupt president of our time. Uh, yet he was hailing Trump as some kind of savior and a hero. So I'm always willing to work uh, across the aisle, but we got to make sure that we're working with people who have the country's interest at heart. Mm -hmm. So just last question, because we're, sure. we're really out of time. Mm -hmm. um, what can you imagine would be the biggest challenge for you if you were to win this seat? Sure. I, I think it would be, for me, one, um, making sure that we're fighting, keeping the agenda uh, on the people in this district, working families. Uh, although we've got uh, a shared challenge with a lot of folks across this country, my concern is, is that we're worried so much about Trump uh, putting out fires that he's running around putting 
steading uh, across uh, the country that we're losing our focus on working families. So to me, it's making sure that we stay uh, on the agenda for people who need us to stand up the most, as opposed to just fighting against Mr. Trump all the time. Well, Mr. Bunkadeko, thank you for coming in and joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Every second Saturday of the month, Weeksville Heritage Center hosts free activities, workshops, and tours of the historic Hunterfly Road houses, essentially Weeksville's centerpiece on the site of America's second largest free black community in pre-Civil War America. And this Saturday is extra special because they're teaming up with BRICS Brooklyn Free Speech for film screenings, face painting, and yes, bouncy castles. To tell us more about the center and the event this Saturday, we welcome back to the show Weeksville Heritage Center's Executive Director, Rob Fields. Rob, thanks for being back no, here. Thanks for having and me. And Matthew Allen, Community Producer Liaison for BRICS Brooklyn Free Speech. Thanks for joining us, Matthew. Thanks for having me. On so, the yeah, thank you guys. So it's great to have you back and mm -hmm. great to talk about Weeksville um, and great to talk about this event coming up on this Saturday. Really quickly though, Rob, just for people who still may not be familiar with Weeksville, can you just give us the short kind of elevator pitch of what Weeksville is? Right, Weeksville Heritage Center, Weeksville is an historic site, um, and it was the site of, as you noted, second largest free African American community in pre-Civil War America. At its height, there were 500 or so people living, um, running businesses, and doing all kind of exciting, entrepreneurial, self-determined things in this area uh, it, before the Civil War, um, when that part of Brooklyn, which is now Crying Heights, it was farmland, basically. And out of that community has come, you know, the first black doctor in New York State, a nationally known journalist, uh, mm -hmm. some institutions that still exist to this day, Berean Baptist Church, uh, St. Philip's uh, Church. Um, so there's been a lot that's come out of that community, and we're trying to keep that history alive mm -hmm. and also take that inspiration and make it relevant to people today. Right. So it does a whole lot more than just commemorate that Correct. history. And, and Matthew, what makes it a good partner for this kind of relationship for what Brick Free, um, Br Brooklyn Free Speech is doing and the kind of programming you're working on? Well, for this particular event, it's a great opportunity for us to help out in terms of bringing families in and bringing in people who otherwise wouldn't know too much about Brick. Uh, it's called kind of a cross-pollination, if mm -hmm. you will. So you get, to know, um, you get to know people that would want to come and be a part of it and get to know people mm -hmm. that would see the programs that we're screening and then they'll want to know more about it and then they come and you know then they do their own show right and so I was saying off camera Rob I always have this question in the back of my mind I've wanted to bring my family there but I've got some different age ranges I've got mm -hmm. an 11 year old 13 year old who I think could go and really fully partake in the experience and I've got a four-year-old who, for whom maybe this weekend is the perfect time because you guys have the bouncy castles and something else you're gonna reveal right now. We have bouncy houses, we have also, we have art workshops, face painting, all kind of stuff uh, for kids. We also have a giant Jenga table, no which way. is going to make lots of noise <laughs> oh. when it crashes down. So if you wanna get your kids out of the house and get them to the Jenga table, they can build it and pull out that last brick and crash it down and make as much noise as they want. It's not in your house. So so I just tell people just to come on and bring the kids. And we're talking about giant Jenga pieces. Yes, exactly, oh exactly. That's on. A, I, take, I think the table's like I don't know, like three by three, and so the blocks are kind of that long. Mm. So and it goes pretty high, and you know when those kids get to pulling that last piece out, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of noise. So mm. has the staff been playing with it this week? Yeah, they, they do, they do, they do, they do. Because um, it's fun, right? It it's is, fun, it is it's fun. fun. And, and Matthew, so tell me what, some, what are some of the special things that are that Brick's bringing um, to this second Saturday, this coming Saturday? Well, for this particular event, uh, it's starting off with our regular screening series that uh, I produce along with my partner, Jessica Mason, the education coordinator, called Be Seen. It's basically thematic screenings for our community producers who produce programs for Brooklyn Free Speech public access TV station upstairs uh, in the media center. And uh, for this particular one, appropriately enough, we're doing youth-related programming. So we, have, we actually have um, a child um, Sincere Quinones, who's going to be hosting the show. He co-hosted it last year. Mm -hmm. This year he's flying solo. Uh, and also his dad will be there on the panel um, 
to be able to show their show, Kids Want to Know, which he, which Sincere hosts. Uh, we'll also be hosting a program called One Peg Boss, uh, which is a wonderful animated or stop animation program. And then you have another show called um, a, a Show for Kids of Color mm -hmm. that we'll be showing. And that's going to be uh, an excellent event, wonderful youth-related event. We also are doing some green screening. Uh, for folks that are going to come by. and Everybody uh, loves the green screen. Yes, green screens are great. And uh, we'll also be doing Father's Day shout outs, mm -hmm. utilizing a new app that we have upstairs called Beehive uh, for people to be able to uh, take sh uh, short form videos and then use the app to upload them uh, to our server and then we'll be able to put them on our channels. Mm -hmm. So sounds... we'll be doing Father's Day shout outs with them. That sounds great. So this collaboration has been happening. This isn't the first year. The, the yeah, great. this is like the third second, year. the third, 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 third year. year. Third year. Yeah. Third year, because you know, I think that uh, one of the one of the key things is as you are building an institution, you quickly realize that in order to get it to where your vision is, you can't go it alone. You have to work in partnership with other community cultural organizations, and you know, Brick is a great partner to have, and so we're thrilled uh, mm -hmm. to be able to do this, um, and we're thrilled that you guys are coming back, and we're just trying to make it bigger and better so that we. Weeksville is uh, more well known and not the, one of the best kept secrets in Brooklyn. So it, it is that you know it is yeah. one of the best kept secrets it in is. Brooklyn. It seems you tell people still. I mean, this is the 50th year mm -hmm. of, of the Heritage Center's existence, mm -hmm. right? You it's guys the 50th anniversary oh. of the rediscovery of the historic okay. Underfly Road houses. Got well, we're calling it the 50th. Right. You know, so we'll take that. Sure, we'll, we'll give that to yeah. you. In the short time that we have left, Matthew, I just wanted to ask you, since you've been going to Weeksville over the years, I just wonder what some of your favorite aspects of, of the Heritage Center are. Um, much like Brick, I love the cross-pollinations of different uh, disciplines. Uh, I love the art uh, exhibits that happen there, and particularly the music-related art exhibits. Uh, I love um, the things like the dinner theater that they've uh, established um, over the recent times. Uh, they also do sort of contests, you know, poetry slams and things of that cool. nature. I just love it when different aspects of art mold together. I used to go to the garden parties and then they had uh, musicians come uh, before the renovation uh, and it was beautiful. And um, of course, having this partnership now, it, it gives me an excuse to, to go over there for a job situation, which is uh, all a guy like me could ask for. Great. And, and Rob, in the 30 seconds we have left, any other events coming up that you just want to um, give a notice about? Yes, we are. One of the things that's happening on Saturday will be a curatorial talk about the current art exhibit uh, and public history project in pursuit of freedom now and forward ever, sacred ground, um, sovereign space that Monica Montgomery will be leading. Um, the 19th, starting the 19th of June, we'll have unapologetically Black Week, mm -hmm. which is kicking off on Juneteenth mm -hmm. uh, with panel panel discussions, a black men's forum, a summer Friday party, and then we're closing in pursuit of freedom now on Saturday the 23rd with a bunch of stuff. So, And for people to find out more, the website is? WeeksvilleSociety.org. WeeksvilleSociety.org. Well, gentlemen, thank you again for coming in and sharing all this with us. I hope to see you this weekend. Wonderful. Okay. Bye. And that's the show. We'll be back tomorrow with Linda Sarsour, who will give us her perspective on the situation in Gaza and perhaps her rumored candidacy for city council. Thanks.